Welcome to this session, which is part of the battle for the media strand. Yeah, I'm really pleased to kick this off with the, the session Stop the Press, the media after Leveson. There is an increasing backlash you hear, increasingly people expressing concerns about what Leveson might come up with. Critics of the Leveson inquiry, though, have often been uh, accused of creating straw men when they warn of some kind of state interference in the media or a statutory backstop. And I, I think uh, it would be really important in this session to try and question whether or not the inquiry itself is a form of state interference. Uh, and when Leveson kicked off um, the, the inquiry, and uh, his central question was, who guards the guardians? But I think given the fact that the Leveson inquiry has expanded so far, unlike pretty much any public inquiry before it, it's not just looking at a specific incidents like, for example, um, the, the phone, phone hacking, it's looking at the culture, practice and ethics of the press in general. When one judge gets so much power to pass judgments about what can be done uh, in something as fundamental as, uh, as, uh, 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 as the press to democratic freedoms, I think it's very important that we also start to scrutinise what's going on at the Leveson Inquiry and ask some questions about that ourselves. I'm delighted to have a, a, a fantastic panel of speakers who are going to uh, talk for five, seven minutes each. First will be Professor George Brock, who's the head of journalism uh, at City University London. Uh, he's the former managing editor and the Saturday editor uh, of the, the Times and a board member of the World Editors Forum. Delighted to have you here, George. Uh, speaking second will be Christina Patterson, who many of you, I'm sure, will know as a writer and columnist for The Independent. Um, Speaking third will be Ray Snoddy, who's a freelance journalist and was the former presenter of BBC's Newswatch and the author of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, which I think we've got in the foils bookshop upstairs. Uh, and um, I, I do thoroughly recommend you taking a look at that. And last but very much not least uh, is Mick Hume, who's the editor of Large at Spite and the author of the newly published book, There Is No Such Thing As A Free Press and we need one more than ever. And special mention goes, uh, go, goes to Mick for being one of the inspirations behind this battle for the media uh, strands. So without further ado from me, if I hand over to George to speak for, for, for five or six minutes. George. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, congratulations on um, making it to this session so early on a Sunday morning. Patrick asked just now what uh, we should think about, or whether we should think that the Leveson inquiry and the debates that it's given rise to amount to state interference in the press. And he also reminded us that Leveson asked right at the beginning of his inquiry, about a year ago, he said, who guards the guards? I'm going to argue to you quickly that this is a perfectly reasonable question for people to ask. To claim that even to ask it, never mind for one second what the answers might be, but to claim that even to ask it is to chill freedom of expression is, I think, inherently unreasonable and it has no historical basis at all. Societies ask this question in varied forms all the time. There's been a discussion going on about it more or less continuously in Britain ever since mass newspapers really became mass newspapers, approximately a century ago. Um, there have been three royal commissions since the Second World War alone. And in any society where you get a collision of basic rights, I would define this as a collision between the basic right to privacy and the right to free expression, where you get a collision of basic rights, you're very likely to get a constant re-examination of the main question. So to examine it seems absolutely fine. I will just get my reservations about the Leveson inquiry out of the way quite quickly. I think the government, panicked by the fuss about the Dowler phone hacking, established an inquiry that is probably has far too big a machinery for the question they're looking at. He's operating under the Inquiries Act, and uh, Patrick predicted just now that he was due to report, Leveson was due to report in October or November, I mean, he'll be very lucky, given that he has to tell everybody what he's going to say about them if it's going to be critical. He'll be really lucky if he finishes by then. And I think the terms of reference are far too wide. But on the side of any inquiry of this kind, one of the good things that it does, it does long before it ever reports or recommends anything at all, which is simply that it allows a platform for everybody to ventilate their feelings and opinions. 
And that's a good thing that an inquiry can do because there were a lot of opinions and feelings that needed ventilation about this. Leveson has been very hampered by the fact that he's in parallel with police inquiries. Um, there have always been restraints on publication of some kind. The argument is whether they're good or bad. The idea that you could live in a world in which there were no restraints on expression strikes me as other planet stuff. So the question is not all or none. The question is exactly how much. So the issues are what laws should you have, which are the minimum necessary restrictions on free expression, what regulatory machinery you should have that should accompany that, if any. And, and this I think is really important and is my main point this morning, in what relation do the laws and the regulations work? Now, most of what actually turned up at Leveson was really about the proper enforcement of law. It was actually about the relationship between the press and Scotland Yard and the politicians and so on. Laws covered virtually all of the most serious things, most of them criminal laws, that we actually heard about at, at Leveson. And indeed, there's a piece in the Sunday Times this morning which quotes a lawyer called Richard Shillito of Farrah's, I mean, a law practice that specializes in media, who adv and they advise, and he says, breach of privacy, copyright, confidence, harassment, data theft, forgery, hacking of computers and phones, contempt of court, parliament, all these are covered by existing law. But actually, of course, a large amount of the debate that has gone on around Leveson hasn't really been about the enforcement of law. It's been about whether or not there should be a better regulation of the press, by which campaigners usually mean, or often put it as, a regulator with teeth. And a lot of this discussion has been about how you equip a regulator with a better set of dentures. I think this, my personal view is that this is a mistake and it is quite likely to lead Leveson into an error. Now, I'm not going to pretend to you that I know what he's going to say. There are a large number of people taking up position at the moment in a completely phony war type of way. Nobody has any idea exactly what he's going to recommend. So all this is shadow boxing. My own, my own view is that actually what Leveson could do, but I fear he's very unlikely to do, is to actually strengthen freedom of expression by making a really strong call to strengthen public interest defenses in laws that don't have them. If you look at all of the laws, and I gave them in Shillito's list just now, well, sorry, it's not a complete list, but it covers quite a lot of them, the public interest defenses, that is to say the exemptions which allow a court to say there was a better purpose, there was a higher better purpose here, so we are not going to punish according to the law, the public interest defences are very weak, sometimes non-existent, um, and very inconsistently expressed. What I would prefer to see is essentially a bargain in which the laws, the public interest defences helping good, good journalism in the public interest are strengthened, and that if you could show it to a court when you were fighting for a public interest defence because you had done an investigative piece of journalism which involved removing somebody's documents and there was an argument about whether this was theft, invasion of privacy or whatever, my imagi an imaginary temporary example, that the newsroom or the online website or the newspaper or whatever could claim that their editorial processes were sufficiently good that they were entitled to a public interest defence. That probably would mean a self-regulatory system and I don't think it would require the state backing. Because we're being asked to be brief, I'm, I've gone through my own prescription at great speed. If you um, want to ask me more about that, please do so. What I like about the use of public interest defences is that it bites on the process of journalism. It reduces the risk that you are actually regulating the content. Now, there is a philosophical argument against this. My colleague at City University, Heather Brook, and I suspect Mick in due course, will argue that even to have a public interest defence or to introduce that very idea is to allow the state to define what good journalism is. I think that it is perfectly reasonable for society to have some of those definitions. The one that I think restricts the freedom of the press, le uh, sorry, restricts least the freedom of the press is the better use of public interest defences. I'll leave my introduction there. Thanks very much, George. Well, the quickest response would just be to say I largely agree, but I won't just do that. 
yesterday I took part in a panel here on the crisis in compassion. And I was invited because I've had quite a few experiences of terrible nursing and I've done quite a lot of investigative work both for The Independent and for Radio 4 on it. And as part of this, I went on a course in um, an NHS learning hospital, which was meant to be very good at helping NHS staff, doctors, nurses, uh, medics of all kinds to, to provide better care. I'd heard it could be quite a powerful experience and uh, the organisers were very happy for me to interview anyone on it. But it was two days after the Millie Dowler scandal broke and I couldn't get anyone to say a word. And it seemed at the time like a fairly graphic example of how good journalism or what you hope will be good journalism, i.e. trying to find out about things and how to make them a bit better, was being hampered by what you might call bad journalism, i.e. exploiting the grief of people who never asked to be in the public eye in the first place. But as a Leveson inquiry has unfolded, it has been hard not to worry that good journalism as well as bad journalism is now under threat. The trouble is, it's under threat anyway because of simple economics. Those of us who work on newspapers spend quite a lot of our time wondering how many more months or years we've got. We know there isn't an infinite supply of Australian media moguls or Russian oligarchs to pay for the stuff we produce. We know that readers who increasingly don't want to pay for anything they read won't be paying for it. We know that phones that are hacked are much more likely to sell newspapers than investigations into the state of nursing. And we worry that this inquiry has sometimes given the impression of a thriving industry that must be tamed instead of one that's now practically on its knees. And I'm not, by the way, just talking about print. I'm talking about journalism by people who are paid to produce it, who know how to produce it. Now, there's been a lot of drama in the Leveson inquiry, and it has to be said, quite a lot of entertainment. But we should remember that it started because of the dogged efforts of one investigative reporter who did some of the work the police should have done. As George said, a lot of this stuff was illegal, and it was Nick Davies who dug deep and found the links between people in these overlapping spheres of power and who uncovered lies and half-truths and criminal cases that the police barely seemed to have touched. It was Nick Davies who reminded us at the heart of this inquiry, which has shown its darkest depths, what journalism is for. And what he uncovered, although many people had some idea of this already, was a pretty rotten culture, a culture where newspaper editors and police officers and politicians all scratched each other's backs. It was a culture of camaraderie, but also of bullying and fear. But what he didn't need to uncover was the culture that put photographs of a girl's funeral or an actor's pregnant ex-girlfriend as a prize to get at any price. People were shocked when they find out how some journalists got hold of some of the stories they published. But where did they think those stories came from? Or perhaps it was more convenient for them not to think about that at all. It isn't just the press or certain sectors of the press that's on trial. Personally, I think it's our whole culture of celebrity. We can't just pretend that this is a problem of the press. And we also, I think, can't carry on behaving forever as if the press is entirely separate to the world of online news or so-called so news. Now, I'm very glad I'm not Leveson because it's very, very tricky stuff. I think it's clear to everyone that the current form of press regulation has failed. Uh, I also think like George does, that if the police had done their job, a lot of this stuff was just about the law, and, you know, therefore a lot of it was unnecessary. But the law failed, the police failed, and therefore we've had to bring this stuff into a public arena. I think we need to do a much better job at working out what is in the public interest, and therefore can occasionally justify the use of deceit, rather than what the public is titillated by, which shouldn't. Personally, I don't care if the new system of regulation is part of the press or independent of it, but I do think we need to have better ways of holding people to account. Personally, I don't think so-called celebrities lose any right to any private life. I've interviewed hundreds of very famous people, and many of them 
don't particularly enjoy being famous. Often it is a byproduct of them being very good or successful at something. And I don't think just because you've given an interview to publicise a play or a film you're in that you lose, that the rest of your life is fair game. I don't think, I think we probably do need some change to our privacy laws. I, I'm not sure exactly where I would pitch it, probably not as far as France, but I think we do need some change. And I wouldn't see that as a massive threat to a free press. I think probably we do need to make journalists more accountable. And I think we need to give people who are harmed by the press quicker and better redress. But what I care about much more than any of this is how we can save the press. Thanks. I'll start off with a quote. I deplore the putrid state into which our newspapers have passed and the malignity, the vulgarity and the mendacious spirit of those who write for them. The slightly archaic language might uh, alert you to the fact that this was not evidence before uh, Lord Justice Jefferson, uh, 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 Levison, but Thomas Jefferson in 1787. I did write a book about the history of all of this press scandals throughout the ages, Believe me, there's nothing new other than the new bit of technology that allowed rather unscrupulous hacks to do something that couldn't be done in the past. And as George said, there's, not, there's absolutely nothing new about inquiries into the press. There has been, one, been some sort of inquiry on average once a decade. What is really interesting is that since the PCC has been set up, there hasn't been any for more than 25 years. And I, I do take exception with the previous speaker that the present system has failed. It did not fail. It was never set up to bring people to justice, work that the police should have done. And I will be arguing in a moment most strongly for a revised form of self-regulation and argue as strongly and getting stronger in my mind by the day that a line has to be held on any form of statutory intervention with the press. American society runs without any press councils or press complaints commission, and this has a First Amendment, and there is no regulation of the press in America. I know at all. I know it's a different society, and we have dis different traditions, and I'm not actually arguing for that, but absolutely arguing for and I'm rather horrified that some editors and former editors have said, oh, well, we can have a little bit of statutory underpinning like in Ireland. And because I'm from Ireland, I can say that the investigative journalism in a bankrupt com country that didn't expose its paedophile priests for 30 years is not exactly a model I would wish on anyone. Though I am not arguing for a direct connection between the two. I have to also attack our previous speaker, and I think attack is the right word, because, uh, because um, I have to go on the attack because mine is such a minority view. I've changed my mind um, on, on, on the exposure of actresses and dodgy comedians who have now been trying to get the press regulated. And I, 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 I if you give, give you my, pre, my previous antecedents, 20 near blameless years on the Financial Times, not a single phone hacked, not a privacy uh, invaded, and an almost <laughs> um, worries that kept me awake at night if I could spell somebody's name wrong. And I tried my best to continue that eight years on the time. So I come not as an obvious apologi apologist for a scurrilous tabloid press, but I've now decided that a scurrilous and tabloid press, in addition to the good works of the Independent and the Times and the Financial Times, is absolutely essential. And even if it wasn't, it's going to happen in the internet world. So here's what I'm uh, arguing. I'm, I'm quoting myself, so that's not plagiarism, I don't think. Um, it's in a chapter of a book uh, on post-Leveson World, which comes out on Thursday. I'm arguing that my views will outrage many by suggesting that those who earn vast sums of money in the public domain trade off a pure image and can be seen as role models for the young should be exposed by currently legal means when there is a vast gulf between that image and their actual behaviour. And some judges have even recognised this. In the case of Rio Ferdinand, the judge of the High Court decided that he was a role model and had to behave uh, uh, in a reasonable manner or take the consequences. 
The law, in a curious way, is going in my direction. A case that didn't receive at the, at the Court of Human Rights, that didn't receive too much publicity in February, a landmark decision, the private lives of celebrities are of legitimate interest to the media. The European Court of Human Rights has included in landmark judges in, uh, judgments involving a cocaine-possessing German TV actor and Princess Caroline of Monaco. Obviously, I can't go into details. Here's my take. I thought Levison was a dreadful mistake by a PR former PR man for a television company that didn't make one memorable program in its entire life. He just happened to become prime minister. Um, and uh, he, 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 he reached for the instant PR man's uh, choice and inquiry with far too broad a terms of reference. Standards, practices, ethics. Let's try that to lawyers. Let's have an inquiry into the standards, practices, and ethics of lawyers, and you'd have a queue round the block from people wanting to denounce them. Let's try the pharmaceutical industry, the great British pharmaceutical industry. Find a billion dollars in the States for bribing doctors to give inappropriate drugs. The BBC has, has taken great glee in hammering the press throughout Levison and are now having a similar sort of thing happen to them. And I will be I'll be opening I'll be opening a book. I'll be opening a book at the back, Odds on George Antwistle being Director General of the BBC by the turn of the year. Um, we will be setting those odds quite soon. Mm -hmm. I thought Levison was a huge mistake, a political uh, mistake by Cameron. One minute left, dear God. Okay, I can't say I can't go through the history. Forwards. I think with my one minute left, Levison has done his work. He's exposed practices, casual brutality of the press that, that cannot be condoned. The act, very act of the thing, though exaggerated, has been cathartic. And that the very things that are up before that commission will never happen again. The way forward is the legendary self-regulatory regulatory body with teeth, newspapers tied into commercial contracts, the ability to fines as Lord, up to a million pounds, as Lord Hunt said, and, and, that, and they sign up to that um, by commercial contract. If they do not accept that, then the last chance saloon drinking up has to end. And I was the journalist who interviewed David Meller on a, on a Channel 4 programme called Hard News, where he first coined those immortal words. Uh, I have to accept that if the press does not put its house in order, but without statutory underpinning, then there will be no arguments left and legislation will follow. It would be an absolute tragedy if such a thing were to happen. Thank you very much. Ray. I think a lot of these discussions are, do have a lot of historical antecedents. And the, uh, as Ray points out, there's the question of um, uh, newspaper scandals and what to do about them. It's, a, it's, a, it's as old as uh, the press itself. But I think before we get into the discussion of the details of what form of regulation we might or might not be in favour of, there's a more fundamental problem underpinning this discussion that is new that I think we ought to uh, uh, address, which is a loss of faith uh, in the very idea of, the free, of, a free, of a free press in any kind of meaningful sense, and a loss of faith in a free press amongst those sections of society and the, the kind of um, uh, liberal intelligentsia, the liberal media itself, um, which would have normally been thought of as being those which would uh, first rally to its defence. Uh, I didn't go to the uh, do last night, I went home and I actually ended up watching the thick of it, um, which was the episode that was a kind of version, their version of the, of the Leveson inquiry. It was an inquiry into government leaks, but it was the same, uh, it was obviously a kind of take of, 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 uh, of Leveson. And it was the usual kind of, you know, anti-political uh, cynicism with the odd good um, sweary joke. Uh, uh, thrown in. But the, and the, the one really good line in it, I thought, was when one of the worthies from the, the grandees from the uh, inquiry was quizzing uh, Malcolm Tucker, the kind of Alistair Campbell uh, figure, uh, and was quoting at him some of his own press coverage. She quoted The Guardian at him, and Tucker says, oh yes, The Guardian, the newspaper that hates newspapers. Mm. <laughs> Which I thought was a great line, actually, uh, uh, Ian Uch's kind of uh, uh, hit on there. Or perhaps we ought to be more precise, we ought to say the newspaper that hates popular newspapers, because popular is a dirty word in many of these uh, uh, circles. And more importantly, I think, a newspaper which has a fear and loathing of popular newspaper readers and what they are capable of if they are exposed to uh, um, uh, tabloid uh, propaganda. And, you know, over 500 years of this debate, um, those who are worried about the press and want to regulate and control the press have always really had at the base of that a, a fear and, and loathing of the populace and, and a wish to regulate uh, uh, the thoughts and, uh, and opinions uh, of those who consume the media. But it's not just the Guardian. Not, I, I only mention them because of that uh, uh, joke. But um, you know, they are kind of symbolic uh, of a, 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 a liberal media class. I think that, was, that, in a much wider sense, has lost its faith 
in a free press. Uh, that, that all subscribe to the view, that, uh, the uh, opinion that I believe in a free press, but which I talk about in my in, in my book is now the kind of mantra of the age, and and the, and the buts are getting uh, 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 bigger and bigger. And I think. The way in which so many of them signed up to the Leveson Inquiry was, was really a, a kind of demonstration of that in practice. Because the Leveson Inquiry, by any historical standard, is a pretty unprecedented uh, act of state intervention in the British press. Uh, uh, quite remarkably so. And yet, uh, it was signed up to and supported by all of these uh, the kind of uh, uh, liberal media in a way that was uh, very striking. I agree with George that the question that Leveson posed, um, you know, who guards the guardians, um, is a perfectly legitimate one. The point is it's being posed by an unelected, unaccountable judge who's putting himself in a, who has been put in a position to pass judgment. And nobody asked the, the alternative question, who judges the judges? You know, who is to hold Leveson to account uh, uh, for what he says? Who said it was, that he had the responsibility to decide how far back the clock should be turned on the question of state uh, uh, intervention? These questions were simply uh, not asked. The question of the public interest, I agree, a very important debate that should be had. But the debate that's being had is who should decide the public interest. That's what Leveson and his lawyer said at the beginning of the inquiry. The big question, who's going to decide what's in the public interest? The one people we, body of people we can be sure will not be consulted about that is the public. the public. The public interest is something which floats above the public and is used to control what the public is, is or isn't allowed uh, 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 to see. I mentioned this yesterday, that one of my favourite parts of the inquiry, which generally speaking was a pretty dreadful kind of um, uh, uh, watch, uh, was when Hislop uh, from Private Eye suggested to uh, Leveson that he might invite along some News of the World readers uh, to the inquiry to tell them what they thought of the paper and why they bought it. And the, 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 sh the tremor of horror that went through that, uh, uh, the elite kind of uh, uh, bodies gathered there, the very idea that the public might be involved in a public inquiry uh, and really kind of summed up uh, 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 that uh, view. So that's my worry about the public interest, is that, uh, like everything, it won't be the public that gets to decide what it's fit to read. And I worry very much that, you know, we've got... Liberal newspaper editors, Alan Rusbridger, goes to Leveson and says the British press is underregulated. You know, does he mean the Guardian is underregulated? Or like a parenting expert, does he mean that it's only other people who need help looking after their, 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 their children? Um, even Chris Blackers, who's now talking about the problem with the Leveson having, having seen this, this, this summary, he, he made the point uh, beforehand that he was in favour of the independent editor, that he was in favour of, uh, of licensing journalists, that maybe there was a good case for licensing journalists. He made the point that, well, the jockey club actually stops people riding horses when they broke the rules, so maybe we should stop journalists writing articles when they broke the rules. That's, that, that was his position at the beginning of the Leveson inquiry. What he's saying now might be different. But that was the, the, the hope and the, the kind of faith that was invested in the Leveson thing. And I think the journalism academics uh, have been the worst. They've been actually in the front line of calling for more statutory regulation of the press in a way that I, I find very depressing. Um, there's a piece in the Sunday Times this morning which uh, 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 quotes uh, uh, me and, and, and my book, and it's excited uh, Brian Cathcart of, of Hacked Off to start, uh, who is uh, a man of the left, a new statesman journalist, and now a professor of journalism. But he kind of writes Hugh Grant's scripts for the uh, Hacked Off campaign. And he started tweeting about this is outrageous anti-Leveson propaganda, as if you know, that is a, something which can't be allowed. You can't have people criticising uh, Leveson in the, in, the, in, the, in the national press. And these are the kind of radical journalists and academics at the front line of, of demanding more regulation and state uh, 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 statutory company, fact. Uh, indeed, company accepted. <laughs> Although, so I can, I can turn to reply in a minute. <laughs> even, after, he, and even my friend George here, who's, who's a proper newspaper man, one of my editors, when I was at the Times, you know, now a journalist and academic, wants the, to introduce more um, legislative control in the press, wants there to be a privacy law. So this is the, this is the, the, the I think, uh, um, the, the dark kind of uh, uh, corner that we're painting ourselves into. And it demonstrates a loss of faith in the fundamentals of a free press amongst those who we would look to uh, normally as being its defenders. And I was very struck historically, looking at this question when I was writing the book, about the fact that we have now a liberal media which it seems to me in many ways has less faith in the free press than the Puritans of the 17th century did. Now, the Puritans of the 17th century, the first great campaigners for freedom of the press in this country, in order to, to have the right to publish their non-conformist religious views, um, demanded that there should be a free press because, they said, man, that's the word, they didn't talk about women, man, um, has the God-given ability to judge truth from falsehood. And therefore, we don't need the king or anybody else to protect us from what's published. We're capable of deciding for ourselves. Now, whatever we think of their faith in the God-given part of that, they had more faith in man than many people do today. 
They actually believed that a free press was, did not need to be constrained because people could judge for themselves, uh, and capable of reading for themselves. Obviously, there were men of their time, so when Milton made the case for free press for all, he also made it clear that it didn't include the horrible Catholics uh, in, in, in that, uh, which is kind of a bit like you know, uh, Nick Griffin's tweets today. They, they also, well, we believe in free press, but we can't have Nick Griffin, I and mean, we couldn't have the, Milton didn't want the Catholics having, having a, 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 a free press. But nevertheless, uh, um, one minute, yeah. Um, they had a basic faith in humanity that I think the liberal elite lacks today. Uh, and that's why they talk about we, we must control the press because people are too vulnerable and can't be exposed to all this tabloid propaganda and the terrible effects uh, uh, it will have on them. I think we need to regain uh, and modernise the idea of the fun, a more fundamental belief in a, in a free press as being the bedrock uh, of a free society and the only hope for any kind of human-centred discussion uh, of the future. And I believe in self-regulation with the emphasis on the self uh, 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 rather than the regulation. If anybody wants a statutory framework for regulation the press, I don't think, as George indicates, you know, it's, it's, it's other, planet, other, other planet stuff to talk about a, a lack of regulation. I, I would rather go to that other planet, the United States of America, where, uh, uh, as, as Ray indicates, the first amendment to the Constitution uh, makes clear that it is unconstitutional, i.e. illegal, to pass any law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And uh, I think that is, um, uh, you know, if you want a statutory regulation for, the, for regulating the press, let, let's, let's start there and let's defend uh, the right of our press uh, to be a mess and to make trouble. Thanks very much, Mick. I promised George a right of reply, so George, if you'd like to uh, kick off the discussion. I'm going to quickly start by just listing the things I do agree with uh, Mick about. I absolutely agree with him about the illiberalism of liberals. If you want a really illiberal opinion, in 21st century Britain, go first to a liberal or somebody who describes themselves as such. I actually agree with him mostly about journalism academics, so I'm not going to waste time fighting that point. <laughs> and he closed what he had to say with the American example. And can I remind you that what I was suggesting was that it is the framework of law rather than the machinery of regulation that is really important here. And that is the basis of the American system. The architecture, every society has some kind of architecture for determining what people can say. You can't just say anything. And the, America, the great advantage of the American system is that it is a law-based one. But I do have a few disagreements with Mick, and quickly they are these. Can we just remember, please, that this is a public inquiry which recommends. Leveson is not passing law himself. That remains in the hands of Parliament. Mick asked who should decide what's in the public interest. I'm mainly concerned with getting the question out there in the discussion. Actually, these much maligned figures, the judges, have actually contributed quite significantly to the discussions of this. Um, the great, I mean, now forgotten, but great judge, Lord Denning, contributed a very, very important judgment. People have a way of doing a sort of shopping list definition of the public interest, you know, catching crime, stopping corruption, da 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 da. Denning was faced with a public interest issue in a case called Littler back in the 60s, and he said, well, that's all, that shopping list issues of things that you can in the public interest, that's fine, but actually we should go a bit broader than that. We should say that anything that contributes to the quality of public life, essentially, was what his, I can't quote his decision precisely, but that's roughly what it said. And one of the advantages that we have in a, what I would call a mixed economy of regulation, i.e. in Britain you have highly regulated broadcasting, you have rather less regulated press, I think instinctively the public, who do have opinions about this despite what Mick says, and they can be communicated, and they can actually be consulted. They I don't think, have opinions, George, I think, they don't have a hearing. Yeah, but, I, but actually I think, they can be heard, but I think they can be heard, but my point here is I think intuitively, intuitively people think that a mixed economy of regulation in which you don't have everything regulated on the same basis works relatively well. I do think that Leveson has brought out a lot of points of view on a much wider range than Mick thinks. And lastly, on the privacy law, my point about privacy law is that the present law is illegible in a newsroom. It's incredibly difficult for people to understand what the law, as it exists, there is a privacy law at the moment. My suggestion is simply that it should be improved. Now, as it happened, Ray 
referred to the Rio Ferdinand case. Ferdinand texted a woman who I think he never met. The text of the text appeared in the Sunday Mirror, I think. He sued the Sunday Mirror for breach of privacy. And a 128-paragraph judgment by Mr. Justice Nickel, an extremely expert judge in this area, came down just on the side of the mirror. I defy anyone who is actually handling in practice issues of publication to work out from that judgment whether or not a similar case again, which way it will fall. The law is unworkable. That's my point. I think, therefore, it should be imp improved and refined. And I don't think, lastly, for Mick, that 18th century slogans help us solve this kind of problem in a digital age. I'm sure Mick will want to come back on that, but I'll, I'll turn to Robert. I, I, I take, uh, I take uh, obviously, George's point about recommendations, and all is not lost. Um, we, we have uh, this very week, uh, we have uh, Cabinet Minister Francis Maud defending the sacred right of journalists to hold politicians to account and worried about press freedom under threat around the world, not least by those who think it's not a bad idea to murder and blow up uh, journalists, which we haven't quite got to in this. And in defence in defense of comics, we've had some really bad comics um, coming before Leveson. I don't think Rowan Atkinson did appear, but he is now leading demands for a change in the law to halt the creeping culture of censoriousness, um, which um, under the Public Order Act, where you can't even insult anybody anymore without, uh, without a breach of the law. But I really want to take, partly take up uh, the economic ca case and worries about newspapers as raised by Christina. I should know this better, but I only reacquainted myself a couple of weeks ago with the cir paid circulation figures of the Independent. The Independent sells 83,000 paid copies. The iPaper sells 200,000. That I know. I said, combined, I, yeah. I said, the, I said yeah, quite precisely, the paid circulation of the Independent is 83,000. Mm. That is a pitiful mm. amount. And yes, they've done something quite clever in stripping it down. The I it has an editor and eight sub-editors, that's all. And it's just a, a repurposing and reworking of. But, but I'm, in a sense, I'm making a much bigger point than not being petty. It's this, the sheer economic problems that the press... And this is the week where, where, where Newsweek announced it was no longer viable to have a print edition of Newsweek. Uh, and here's, here's one of my interesting uh, moments from Levison. Uh, it was from a consultant when she appeared before him, Claire Enders. Mm. And, the, and the readers spend 40 minutes a day reading a newspaper and 15 minutes a month grazing through the digital equivalents. So any wonder then that newspapers cannot raise much money on the digital equivalents? And that's where my worry about 83,000 mm. uh, readers of the Independent. They spend 40 minutes a day. Advertisers want to reach them. And here's the exchange when... Sounds all rather depressing, actually, said Lord Justice Levison, to which Claire Enders replied, it's the way things are. Mm -hmm. And I'm really worried that Levison will come up with recommendations that could be accepted by politicians, that could hobble the press at a time when the internet is expanding ever outwards with complete freedom, and that this rather old-fashioned, centuries-old me medium will be hobbled with restraints that don't apply to others, and that the economic consequences could be very serious indeed, like the loss of serious newspapers, unless you have a former KGB colonel prepared to fund them endlessly. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. For well, well, but Raymond, that was the point I was making. I mean, I, I you know, and, um, I was and, and, and I can assure you that I'm a lot more worried about that 83,000 than you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, the truth but is I'm that... Tying it, I'm, I'm doing something different. I'm tying those economics into the fear of Levison, well, well, which you seem to be quite uh, well, happy with statutory regulation. Uh, no, not, I, I'm not quite happy with statutory regulation. I would prefer... You didn't self, denounce it. Um, I would prefer self-regulation. I think some degree of regulation is probably necessary, but yes. I also agree that, um, that I have to say, sitting here on a Sunday morning, whether or not... 
the press, free, free, press freedom in its current form is curtailed a bit, seems to me a bit like, if you don't mind me using the phrase, pissing in the wind, because we are talking a dying industry. You know, the Guardian loses 40 no, million a year. No, only if people like um, you keep calling it a dying no, industry. If, if people here will go out and start buying a daily paper, that would help. But, you know, the Guardian is losing 40 million a year. The Indy is losing quite a lot, not nearly as much as that. The Times is losing 40 million a year. We can argue about the figures, but, you know, you need to be pretty rich to be able to chuck down a loo 40 million a year. So that's, you know, those are the economics of it. Um, to go back to your point uh, about um, hypocrisy and celebrity, Raymond, um, I absolutely accept that hypocrisy of public figures is something that the press has the right to address. Um, I think if politicians, one of whom in fact was married to someone who was here yesterday, put out leaflets in their constituency that give the impression they have a very happy and settled private life and are doing something different to that, I think that is completely fair game. I think that footballers are in a grey area. I'm not sure that they present themselves as role models, but if the case can be made that they have presented themselves as role models and behaved hypocritically, I agree, they're fair game. But I, but I also think that um, many so-called celebrities haven't made millions out of their celebrity, didn't particularly ask to be celebrities. I mean, I interviewed Daniel Radcliffe the other day. You know, he was a child actor. He didn't, I'm sure he didn't think for a moment when he went for that audition that he would suddenly be unable to walk down the street without being mobbed and have every little, every snog with every, you know, girl he ever meets splashed all over the papers. He is, in fact, a very lovely bloke. He likes acting. He doesn't want to be famous. I've interviewed lots of people. I mean, he's not moaning about it. He's very, very gracious about it. But the impression I have is he didn't particularly want that. And I don't accept that people who have happened to become famous, uh, that their private life is fair game. And I absolutely don't accept, and this ties in with what you said, Mick, about, um, uh, I think, regulating the thoughts and opinions of the, of the populace. I completely agree that many people on, in the so-called liberal press are fantastically snobbish about the popular press. I think the popular press does an amazing job, and I think that you have to respect the views of um, you know, the, the bigger chunk of the population than the tiny chunk that buys the Guardian or the Independent, the tiny and shrinking chunk that buys the Guardian and the Independent. But I, do, but I also think this is not about regulating their thoughts and opinions. It's about recognising the lines that shouldn't be crossed. And personally, I think that when a couple like the Dowlers, who never asked to be in the public eye, when um, uh, uh, they have, I think, some kind of walk, they reenact Millie's last walk or something like that. I can't remember the precise details. And the policeman sells that story to the news of the world so that them commemorating their dead daughter that is splashed all over the front page of a newspaper or a prime minister whose son is diagnosed with a terminal disease when that is splashed all over a newspaper before even half their family have heard about it personally I think that is crossing a line and I think when I'm talking about regulation that's the kind of regulation that I'm talking about uh, yeah lots of um, points I won't try and answer more so bit, I'll take the rest of the session. Um, just on this the thing about that George uh, mentioned about Leveson only recommends. Um, this is true. My point is that Leveson should not be recommending anything about how uh, a free press operates uh, in a free uh, society. He got very annoyed with Michael Gove, uh, almost the only witness to actually uh, put him on the spot um, uh, during the hearings, um, the Tory uh, cabinet minister. A Tory cabinet minister, by the way, who, um, when I was the editor of Living Marxism magazine, uh, recruited me to write columns for the Times. So Michael Gove does have actually a bit of history on being a bit slightly open-minded on, on freedom of the press. Um, whatever we might think of his education policies or anything else. But um, he, uh, when Gove put uh, Leveson, rather, rather annoyed Leveson by, by suggesting to him that a free press was better than a regulated one and that a free press had the right to offend people... Uh, um, Leveson said, I don't need to be told about a free press, Mr Gove, really, I don't. Well, if that was true, you wouldn't have been sitting there. You know, you wouldn't have been sitting there in charge of a state inquiry into the operation of a free press if, 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 you, if you really believe that. The basis on which that inquiry was set up, the whole phone hacking thing was, was purely a pretext and was turned into a, basically an inquisition into the culture and ethics of the entire British press on the basis of a, of a, of a scandal involving one closed newspaper employing one uh, a, a private detective. Um, 
It, 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 yes, it was. That, that's, that's what the phone hacking scam was actually about. Uh, and on the basis of that, that became the pretext for an inquiry, a state inquiry, as I said, see it, an inquisition into the entire culture and ethics, it was called, of the British press. Now, obviously, Leveson was told, come back with some recommendations. First of all, does anybody really believe that the government wanted or expected Leveson to come back and say, the press is fine? Or it's not free enough. Uh, there are too many. We should get rid of libel laws and we should get rid of all these other restrictions on the press and have a more free and open press. Does anybody really believe that that's what Cameron expected uh, 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 Leveson to come up with? Uh, of course not. It was very clear from the first that this was about, and all sides accepted, this is, my, this is the beginning, my beginning point of the discussion, all sides accepted the myth which this whole thing has been founded on, which is the British press is too free. The British press has been too free to run wild and therefore we need to tame it. We need to sanitise it. And that's been accepted by all sides of this discussion. And that's the problem. So which means whatever Leveson comes up with and whatever knots Cameron ties himself in, uh, uh, trying to come up with a solution which he's going to have a big problem with, uh, we can all see that. Because he's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place or, or a Michael Gove and a Hugh Grant, we might uh, 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 otherwise call it. Um, whatever he comes up with, a consensus has been created that something must be done to sanitise and control and tame the British press. And that's the real problem. So that even the self-regulation proposals on the table from Lord Hunt and all the old PCC crowd would give a new independent regulator more powers to police the press than the police have got. That's what self-regulation is now supposed to be. Well, that's not my idea of, 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 of self-regulation. So I think that's a real problem. Now, just one last point quickly for my, uh, uh, Patrick, about the 21st century, so the digital age stuff and the, 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 the changing media. I agree that we don't live in the 17th century, and there's no point just repeating uh, the slogans of that time. However, I think if we took the spirit of the 17th century uh, 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 movement for, for freedom of the press, we're actually, uh, it, the possibility of having a, a, a diverse and open new press today are far greater than ever before, because, precisely because of the possibilities of the web and of online publishing. And that's what we ought to be devoting our attention. And the newspapers are in an economic crisis, that's undoubtedly true. But the, as long as people want to be entertained, informed and argued with, the press in some form, and probably in many forms, is going to survive. And the question is, what kind of journalism and how free is that press going to be? Thanks very much, Mick. I'd like to take some points to the floor now. I'll take three or four points, then come back to the, uh, to the panel. As a member of the public that shares Mick's frustration with the judiciary, um, how could the panellists recommend that we as the public um, make our voice heard more? Um, because I tend to share Mick's view that the public inquiry, the public are absent. Um, and within the media, the public are always seen as the, the audience and for who you're writing to and responding to. But how can the public make their voice heard more than it currently is? First of all, I don't think that Milton had to deal with the mobile phone and Thomas Jefferson with the snatch photograph. And I understand that now 40 uh, news international journalists have been arrested for various offences to do with hacking. And what I want to do is look, there will be a system coming in and we've got to make it operational. It's got to work. I can imagine you could get a code that looks something a bit like the BBC Journalist Code, where comment is one side, news gathering is second side, and the, the two will not actually go and become mixed together in some sort of um, op-ed morass. Uh, so how do you make that work? Now, I suggest that we, we allow two systems to operate. The first system is you will only get your VAT back if you adhere to the code. If you don't want to adhere to the code, then you've got to go by the old rules and uh, pay your full what, tax. Mick said that the public was missing uh, from Levinson's public inquiry. But it, it, the way that all of the press, nearly all of the press, sort of lined up for <laughs> Levinson and kind of joined in this whole spirit of, yes, we need to do something about ourselves, kind of suggests, I'd just like to ask everyone on the panel whether they think that the press has become a bit afraid of the public. You know, perhaps it's got so disconnected from its readership and its listeners and its viewers that it's, it's, it's become actually kind of afraid of it, worried that it might bite it back if it's seen to have been misbehaving. And it's kind of punishing itself way, way too much, perhaps. Since we've observed that PCC's been around for 25 years and I believe regulation of the press was not tighter before that, Instead of asking whether the regulation is tight enough, perhaps all the laws, we should ask what's changed in society that's led to a press which behaves in the way it does, and what's changed perhaps in politics or the way in which we relate to the public sphere. And maybe the problem is at a societal level rather than at a press level. The press is 
following what people want. Um, after all, if we wanted to not buy the newspapers, which we believe to be acting unethically, we could do that, and yet we continue to buy them. It seems a better approach to try and change the way the society works, grants that may seem, and we won't buy those newspapers like out of business. On the other hand, uh, the potential of the digital is indeed great, and we, are, uh, we would have a more interesting media if we were to properly embrace it. Sadly, at least in the UK and in the US, I'd argue, we've done a very poor job of that. Uh, imagine trying to debate on the pages of The Independent, The Times, The Guardian, uh, or even the news of the world as was. We've done a terrible job of engaging the public in an intelligent way in creating a public sphere of debate online. If we were to do a better job of that, in fact, we might engage people more effectively uh, with a mature and reflective media rather than a salacious media that uh, we've moved towards. In terms of engaging the public, well, the public are our bosses. If you work in a paper, the public is your boss. Um, so you are absolutely right to have a healthy respect for their views because if they don't buy your paper, you're, I was going to use a bad word there, in a bad way. Um, I'm not sure I completely agree that we've done a bad job at uh, involving the public. I mean, you look at any newspaper, you know, I mean, everything I write, you know, read hundreds of pages, well, not always, but, you know, lots of response online, emails, tweets, whatever. I mean, the public does respond. Um, the response is not always coherent or rational, but <laughs> it's there. Um, I'm not sure that it's always all that easy. I mean, you know, what do we mean by the public? 62 million people who live in this country, you know, try and get some consistency of opinion from that, and, you know, you've got quite a challenge on your hands. I think the other thing is that in terms of fear of the public response, well, there has been a lot of hysteria in relation to this whole thing, and it's perfectly possible and indeed the case that people will one day rush out to buy a front page of Millie Dowler's Weeping Parents and the next day be wildly attacking the people who got that story when they discovered how they got it. And as I said earlier, how did they think they got it? Um, so I'm not sure that... I mean, I'm not saying, of course, don't, don't consult the public. Of course you do, but I don't think... I mean, it's a bit like, the, you know, I mean, you bring in capital punishment or whatever. You don't necessarily... There are some things you don't necessarily get particularly... If you were to ask the public to come up with a recommendation for this, it would be a bit like when Downing Street asked for... Um, that online petition and everyone voted for capital punishment, you know, you don't, I, I just, I'm just not sure that's the best way at reaching balanced and rational conclusions on these things. Yeah, in other words, you consult the public, but not about things that they might disagree with you about, uh, uh, like, like hanging. Um, I remember that even, even uh, Jonathan uh, Friedman at The Guardian, when he wrote his book about the American lessons of British democracy, made the point that he thinks there should be a, a public referendum on hanging, even though he thinks that the result would disagree with his views. Because uh, if you're going to have a democracy, you should have a democracy. Um, I do think there's a fear and a, and a contempt for the public in much of this discussion. And I think one of the big problems with the media is it has become a part of a closed oligarchy, the kind of what we, what we sometimes call the political media class, <laughs> which is very closed off for the rest of society. And that's what, you know, lots of the stuff at Leveson that was talked about, about the close relationship between newspaper groups and, and politicians which was obviously talked about in this very gossipy, tittle tattly way. It's very ironic, given that Leveson's supposed to be anti-salacious gossip. All they did was gossip about, um, you know, David Cameron sending LOL texts to Rebecca Brooks, and he didn't know what LOL stood for and all the rest of it. And it was like, ha, 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 you know. Uh, it was all done in this very petty kind of gossipy way. But what, what that fundamentally was pointing out was a, 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 a very close relationship in a different way than historically between the, the political and the media class um, that have become you know, kind of clinging together, I think, for survival in a very isolated kind of bubble. Uh, and they are removed from the public. And I think there's a lot of contempt for uh, the public, uh, and particularly, as I say, the, the attacks on the popular press mm -hmm. re reveal a very low, low opinion of the populace in many examples. I'll take this talk about this. When the News of the World closed, and Ed Miliband announced that the closing of the News of the World was a triumph for people power, you think, what, what about the four million people who bought the News of the World? Mm -hmm every week. Where, where, how was it? And who, actually, what he meant was a triumph for the small number of people on Twitter who'd been organising the kind of campaign to close down uh, the news of the world and had panicked the, the Murdoch uh, 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 empire into doing so. Yeah, but that's, their, that, that's literally what they think of as, as, uh, as, as people. Go. So there's a, there's a fundamental mistrust of the public underneath all of this kind of talk about regulating the press, which I think has to be questioned. One other, one other thing before we go on, just one brief thing. I'm very glad somebody brought up the question of the arrests, because this has not been talked about nearly enough. 
The police campaign against the, the journalists around um, uh, phone hacking and um, uh, immoral, uh, allegedly uh, illegal payments to public officials is an absolutely undiscussed public disgrace. I mean, it's an unprecedented legal assault uh, on the newspaper industry. Uh, and it's remarkable to me. Obviously, journalists should be held to account for the criminal law. But what this has become is the biggest investigation in British criminal history. Can you believe that? The biggest investigation in British criminal history is now about the hacking of, of uh, uh, voicemail messages. And the, and the officer in charge is going to run for another three years, cost 40 million quid, and tie up 200 investigators. In other words, uh, there are many more detectives involved in uh, investigating the fallout from the hacking of Millie Dowler's phone than would ever have been involved in searching for a missing and murdered uh, 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 teenager. Now, that's a very strange set of uh, uh, values, and I think... The question of why has the popular press been turned into effectively public enemy number one in that way is something that should be questioned much more openly. On the um, public front, I mean, I, think, I sort of think it doesn't make sense to talk about the public. What's that? We're all the public. I mean, I, I completely agree with you that editors of newspapers seem pretty far removed from most aspects of ordinary life. They, I mean, you know, many of them get picked up by cars, and uh, possibly not anymore, but at the crack of dawn. And, and, you know, and this whole Chipping Norton set, that, that was a very specific thing. I don't think most of us who work on newspapers, you know, some of us actually live in, you know, relatively real worlds and, and so on. But I think, I think it makes more sense, really, to talk about markets and um, the, the public for the news of the world and the market for the news of the world is very different to the market or the public for The Guardian. So Alan Rusbridger knows that he is going to increase his sales if he's fantastically sanctimonious about, um, about the news of the world. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, sitting on this panel, I'm probably the kind of, uh, you know, sort of token, prissy, centre-left liberal journalist, whereas um, a, lot of, a lot of independent <laughs> readers would probably think I'm Attila the Hun. You know, I mean, it, it's all relative, isn't it? And, and so I think, I think when you're talking about respecting your public, if you're, if you're trying to keep a newspaper in business, you're really talking about respecting your market, and those markets are very, very different. George. Um, how can the public make their voice heard, the first question I asked. I happen to like the system of representative democracy. Representative democracy assumes that the public's views will, to some degree, be mediated through other bodies, principally, of course, parliament, civil society organisations, and so on. But in a plural and open society, where you have an issue that gets at least some people excited, you will consult people or you will listen to their views in a whole number of ways. Uh, there is a hell of a lot more participatory engagement in the news media now than there was 15 years ago, for obvious digital reasons. It was an open inquiry. It got quite a lot of submissions from the public, I understand. I don't know how many, but it got some. And there has been quite a lot of opinion polling, which is, I mean, in which the indications about people's views about how News of the World journalists behave, for example, are pretty clear. Naturally, they're against. Is the press afraid of the public? What I think a lot of new people running news media have become very conscious of in the last 15 years is that they are regarded by a large number of people who consume news media as part of a circus or a game involving all of the media and all of the political class, and they're worried about the gap between it. That would be my, that would be my answer to that question. On the last question, um, you can't legislate for the quality of public reason. You can set good conditions see what I and others have said previously about the legal framework, but you can't actually make people discuss things well. <laughs> That's not feasible. And it shouldn't be feasible in a free society. There has been a... I can't give you the evidence, but there's a, there's a feeling that there's already been a chilling effect on the popular press. I can't tell you about stories that haven't been uh, covered, but there's a widespread feeling that people are being careful because... However, I believe it was The Sun, was it not, that um, broke a story about a politician chief whip on a bike calling police plebs and morons, because... I believe that's what he did call them. So the press is still breaking important stories that ultimately led to a cabinet minister having to resign. So I don't think it's, uh, we're entirely uh, powerless or intimidated, perhaps, even in the way that Mr. Wynne thinks. Um, now, I am going to pick up a, a question from a man who is no longer with us, because I think in one important uh, way he raised an important point. Should newspapers who don't sign up to a code 
lose privileges like VAT. That's not such a bad idea. I believe it, happened, I believe it happens in Ireland. But that is, that is to address the Desmond problem. That's as in Richard Desmond, owner of the Express, who voluntarily took himself off from the Press Complaints Commission. And how can you have, how can you have a self-regulatory system that all publishers don't agree to? So maybe you need a few carrots and sticks, and maybe the VAT uh, issue is one that could be a carrot to pr persuade Mr. Desmond, who I, I know quite well and is only motivated by one thing, more money for Richard Desmond. <laughs> Um, and if you, hear, if you, you can hit him where it hurts and get even him to, uh, uh, to join a code. But I want to, I want to shock Christina to say, um, to say that I, I still bemoan the loss of the news of the world. I read it first every Sunday before the others. And what I makes bet, you I think I Christi don't? What makes you think no, I didn't. I didn't. I, 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 I was going to well, ask why? you, didn't we, a well, regular why, reader of well, the news why, the well, why would you, why would I, why would you, you were saying that I would be shocked not mean that you presume that I would let's, go near Let's it. not presume anything and ask the direct well, question. Mm. Were you a regular reader of the News of the World? I wasn't a regular reader of it, but I'll get, look at all the papers if okay, I get Fair enough. Chance, I yeah. apologise for presuming, but I wasn't yeah, all well, that... Yeah, well, I think that ties in with my previous I, I, point about the I, I, I wasn't left, enough, you know. I wasn't <laughs> all that wrong. You didn't you, 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 and you didn't read, read it, it cover to, You read it cover to cover. Every Sunday. Sunday first before the others. But, but I think Rupert Murdoch made a disastrous mistake to be bullied into closing down the news of the world. It was 2.8 million readers, I, I believe, at the end, wasn't it, George? Um, some uh, like set that. copies, copies sold. Uh, we're just trying to save the Sky deal. Let, let's, uh, George, you wanted to come in. I just wanted to expand Ray's point about the difficulties that regulators, a regulator with teeth is going to experience. Um, you've got the problem of definition. What is a news publication? What is now a journalist in the digital age in which anybody can publish? This is a genuinely difficult issue for the inquiry to solve, I think. Very few witnesses addressed it very directly. There is the problem, there is the related problem of inclusion. That's actually what the guy now departed was talking about. How you define a news publication, online or print, that would be regulated by a better regulator. The idea would be that if you enjoy the VAT exemption, you should, be in, you should lose it if you don't join the regulatory structure. I don't want to get too nerdy about this, but the problem almost certainly is that European law won't allow that to happen. And if that does, you don't have that, then it's very difficult to do. And lastly, and probably the biggest problem, is if there are going to be things like contracts, which a couple of people have referred to as a theoretical possibility, and they were discussed quite a lot on the evidence to Leveson, how the hell are they going to be enforced? If somebody is under contract to agree the penalties and they just say, well, sorry, I think this is completely unjust, and say, what's then going to happen? They're going to try and put the Daily Mail out of business by fining it for months on end? I, don't, I would be very surprised if a government got itself into a position where that was what was going to happen. I just want to make one thing crystal clear. I am not happy when any newspaper closes. I want newspapers to stay alive. Andrew Calcutt, uh, academic, um, <laughs> in favour of free speech, indivisibly so. Contempt for the public and courting readers... Uh, are not mutually exclusive. Uh, in fact, they very often go together rather neat, well, neatly. Um, in magazines, for example, the search is on for the Velcro effect. That's to say what you can do uh, to get the people formerly known as readers to stick around your title and not drift off to any other kind of user-generated content. But how do magazine publishers make their appeal uh, to the people formerly known as readers on the basis that they're not really the public at all, that they don't even constitute uh, a public, that they only exist and, and that they're only interested in the most narrow kind of interpersonal exchanges. So courting the people formerly known as readers dovetails very nicely in, in that respect with contempt for, for the public. I also want to say something about George's um, uh, words in favour of jurists, and you're quite right, George, aren't you, that they can't, all of them, have been uh, absolutely against uh, freedom of speech, or otherwise they'd never have written the American Constitution. But what concerns me about your approach is that I think uh, you go in the direction of introducing a quasi-legalistic process into journalism itself. And especially in the current climate, uh, where it's not a th simply a theoretical abstract question, is it? Uh, it's more likely a question of editorial managers devising policies which fit the script 
by the independent body that's statutorily underpinned, otherwise known as the state being outsourced. And you end up with a ridiculous situation, it really is risible, where a statement is uh, likely to be on the back of newspapers before we know it that says, no child or vulnerable adult <laughs> was harmed uh, in the production of this newspaper. And it's prohibition by quasi-legalistic procedure. And it's no better, no worse, but jolly well no better than state censorship. And I've got a question that's uh, kind of bridging George Brock and um, Mick Hume, which is about the definition of uh, press and moving from uh, paper form press uh, to online publications. And really, I take the point Mick Hume makes about the excitement of the internet and being able to uh, much more freely uh, print things but at the same time, there does seem to be a, a far more censorious approach towards uh, electronic media at the moment than is happening with printed press. So, for example, uh, when it comes to comments that people make on Facebook or Twitter, you do seem to have a, a whole army of police that are, are watching out for this and then going and uh, raiding uh, people in the morning, taking them uh, to police stations, uh, and putting them through uh, quite uh, officious processes and banging them up uh, in jail. And that doesn't seem to be taking place in the press. And maybe that's because the press isn't uh, quite as obnoxious as people can be on uh, Twitter and what have you. But there does seem to be something profoundly censorious. And what is it that's leading to your optimism, uh, Mick, in terms of, of the internet? because, to my mind, there is a lot of real-world politics impacting on the internet. I'm a journalist uh, specialising in the former of Soviet Union. I just want to go back to what Mick was saying about uh, the police investigation, because I always think it's staggeringly hypocritical um, the way that we go, the British, criticise other countries for lack of the free press. Like, we're always doing stories about the shady uh, methods the Russian authorities use to silence journalists uh, or, you know, daring to suggest legislation um, so that Russian journalists can't go digging around, you know, trying to find dirt on officials. Um, yet we have this inquiry that is, um, you know, mooting, introducing exactly the same thing here. And as Mick said, going around, r the police rounding up journalists is terrifying and everyone's just like, whatevs. First of all, I think it's worth recognising that when the um, Leveson inquiry got underway that all the editors um, of the national titles, every single one of them said that there ought to be a change and that their self-regulation wasn't working. They may have backtracked a bit now, closer to the uh, denouement of the affair, but that is what they said. So there was some element uh, to which, you know, I think that they they knew they'd failed and they'd let themselves down. Um, the um, second point is that it might be better to think about it rather than just regulation as perhaps accountability and that if we thought of it as a system of accountability then uh, they might feel better about it and we all might feel that um, the thing was working well. And to that extent it, I think that they recognised that they were not properly accountable, um, that the self-regulatory regime wasn't working and that they were not obeying their own editor's code, particularly in terms of accuracy um, and some other elements in, involving children as well, but not distorting accuracy. These are the prime things in the editor's code that I think they, they felt they weren't obeying. Uh, and I'd also just like to support the idea that uh, George has put forward of changing the public interest tests. And I think journalism could be much, much better if we do actually see the public interest tests are um, allowed much more uh, and that we also support the idea of a stronger privacy laws and that would set a better framework and then maybe we could be more optimistic about the whole situation post that, um, post Leveson. We have worked with regulation in television for decades and Roy Ray has certainly done that 
and uh, I've got a film going out on ITV this Wednesday uh, where we've actually had to work very closely with the Ofcom expected regulations as well as the broadcasting codes. We have internalized, if you like, which other people would call self-censorship, the fact that we are, are at risk of being challenged if we don't get our facts right, and those challenges can be very painful and expensive. And I've had channels, including Channel 5, now owned by Desmond, uh, spend four days with a barrister defending a teacher who went undercover to expose classroom chaos. And so it's not that we don't champion free speech in television. We have worked within statutory frameworks for decades. We've done things like exposing the Winterbourne Green uh, uh, abuse in the care homes, and we just continue to do that. And we haven't, speaking as both a print and a television journalist, I don't find myself with my hands behind my back on television. I find us obliged to do the kind of homework which I wish print journalists were doing all the time, and certainly editors. Now, I do want to put one question to all of you, apart from what, you know, that hasn't been a problem. What are you so frightened of in statutory regulation when television has got an example for you all the time in panorama dispatches and other? The second question is, probably to Mick, but also to the chap back there. Um, do you think vulnerable people are fair game? Is that the economic deal, that you can go after the Dowlers and the McCanns and the other people? The McCanns were the subject to decades, well, not sorry, decades, weeks and weeks and weeks of scurrilous accusations by the Express, long after it was clear that they hadn't done anything. And th anyone whose child dies in a kind of in a tragic accident is fair game for the tabs with a long lens to show their privacy and their, sorry, to invade their privacy and show their grief uh, without ever asking permission. Now, is that okay? And is it okay for 4,000 people to have allegedly have been hacked by the newspapers? I'd love the opinion of the panel on that. Well, I'll, I'll come back on that at the end. Just a, a point about the online uh, uh, question. The point I'm making is about the possibilities of, of online publication. You know, it's in the, I'm talking about in my usual uh, 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 dichotomy of the optimism of the spirit and pessimism of the intellect, which is to recognise that uh, uh, there, is, there are serious problems with online publication, but if we could seize the day, the opportunities for uh, uh, creating a new free press there would seem to me to be unprecedented. I entirely agree that what's happened is that um, the plague of conformism, which is the real problem actually at the heart of the British press today rather than censorship, the plague of conformism has spread into the, what's supposed to be the wildest reaches of the internet, so that Twitter is the home of the Twitch hunt, you know, where anybody who says anything that's uh, slightly uh, outside of the accepted norms uh, will be dumped on uh, by thousands of, of uh, tweeters, who will then report them to the police, and, 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 and so we go around. And so what advertises itself as the free speech wing of the free speech party is in danger of becoming the kind of conformist uh, 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 tendency of the, of, of the conformist movement. On the question of, you know, there's people have, several people have raised the question of the need for new codes and of accountability. And the, it, all these questions always come back to the same point. Who's going to write these codes that the press has to adhere to? And to whom are they going to be accountable? And this was where Michael Gove really upset at Leveson. They had this exchange. I'll just, this will only take me a second just to repeat this to you. Um, Leveson is insisting to Gove. No, 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 he didn't mean that the, that the government was going to be telling newspapers what to do or making them join a system. All he meant was that those papers which refused to join a sensible and approved system would have to face the financial consequences, i.e. it would cost them money not to sign up to the new code. To which Gove responded, all I would say to that is, sensible to whom, approved by whom? And that's the, you know, in a nutshell, that's the, 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 the question at the heart of all this. Uh, um, is that uh, 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 um, uh, all the talk of, of codes and accountability misses the point about who uh, is the press going to be accountable to. And the fact that the, the editor of The Guardian gave the Tory government the idea that they should impose VAT on newspapers which refuse to sign up, i.e. go back to a 21st century version of 19th century taxes on uh, dissident newspapers, uh, is a sign of how far we've gone down the slippery slope. Thanks, mate. Yeah, I'll deal with the Roger Grafe uh, the, uh, questions, and I point, should point out I've, I've worked very pleasurably with Mr Grafe in the past. I disagree with, with virtually every word that has just come out of his mouth. Because, because television voluntarily likes their chains should that be an argument be uh, in the internet age for the same sort of chains being wrapped around newspapers which has been, have been free since the 1850s? The answer is no. Newspapers, tele, television still has the power in the fragmented age to focus into people's living rooms and should accept standards of impartiality and decency. But, uh, newspapers ought to have the right to choose to do something like that or there still should be room for utter scurrility 
in our press, as there has always been throughout the ages. And I'm shocked to my core that such a distinguished producer like Roger Gray wants to, wants to hand over some of his spare chains to us. As for vulnerability, the McCanns, the BBC put up their own hired helicopter to, to follow the McCanns around, uh, 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 around as well, something dealt with in my, my programme. The, the Express libelled them monstrously and paid very large libel damages correctly so, within the law, and just one comment on Millie Dyler. Of course, it was the Millie Dyler case that started all this, um, this move for an inquiry off, but we now know that the bit that gave the real rocket fuel to the inquiry was almost certainly not true. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was that they had hacked and deleted messages within her phone, and that had somehow inhibited police inquiries. We now know, as near as damn it, those messages were deleted automatically, and they, they were guilty of trying to get in, yes, but not that poisonous allegation that they somehow um, uh, inhibited the police inquiries. So, Mr. Gray, on this occasion, I find you guilty in all kinds. Wrong, sir. <laughs> First of all, I want to say I completely agree with you about Twitch hunts. I, in fact, I thought the, I was on Sky News reviewing the papers on Friday night, and I thought that whole Osborne story was a complete... I mean, you know, it was great fun, and I enjoyed talking about it, but it was a, a Twitter storm, really, and, and, you know, built out of nothing. And, um, and I do think Twitter is fantastically censorious and sanctimonious, and it's completely the... the uh, herd mentality which is irritating and you know not any kind of progress um to go back to the comment that uh, the guy over here made about why people who make comments on uh, social media get marched off to jail and pe journalists on the press don't well there's a simple reason for that it's because everything we write is read by lawyers and you know quite often i'll write my column on a tuesday be setting off somewhere and suddenly to my horror get an email from an editor saying oh the lawyer has entirely rewritten your piece and you know turn it into sort of horrendous plodding prose and the last one this happened was a couple of weeks ago and it's the queen i thought for god's sake the queen is not going to sue us you know and i managed to get it undone but you know your heart always sinks because everything gets read by lawyers and the reason um I would probably be torn limb from limb on this panel, but I actually thought, and I might change my mind now, I don't know, one has five minutes to think about this stuff when you're writing a column. I thought that the April Jones Facebook joker, so-called, I mean, he had, it was determined that he had broken the law. The law was 2003. I can't remember, you all remember what the law is. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. There is a law. He was deemed to have broken it. Um, I, I mean, this is an issue of what the laws are, but we don't go to jail because we don't break the laws because lawyers don't let us. Um, and the other point was, um, yeah. I accept that you disagree with, uh, is it Roger, your name? Roger Gray, um, distinguished producer. Roger Gray, distinguished producer, and I look forward to watching his programme this week. Um, I do agree with you that we need to have some way of protecting the most vulnerable, and I don't think that that has worked as effectively as it should have done. George. Andrew Carcutt uh, thinks that I want to hand over the management or supervision of the press to jurists, quasi-legal editorial managers and so on. And can I just enforce and underline something that Christina has just said, which is, if you work in a newsroom or indeed any news organisation or any publication organisation, you are a quasi-jurist already. You are operating in a framework of law. It affects most things that you do. I used to edit an edition of The Times which had a regular column by Julie Burchill. We had, a, we had a dialogue with a lawyer every single Friday. Um, you know, it's, 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 what edit, it's one of the things that editors do. It's not necessarily wrong. Uh, it doesn't involve anything as daft as a harm principle. Brian Cathcart, whose name came up earlier in this discussion, when appearing with me uh, and a number of others at Leveson, said, well, one of the things you could have in a public interest test is a harm principle. Everybody else, including Leveson, bristled at this point as if to say, hang on a minute, it's the purpose of journalism to do harm to some people, isn't it? Mm. Um, and it's not state censorship. Um, the excitement of new technology and so on, J just pulling back historically for one second, almost every new technology that puts people together, the telegraph, the telephone, the aeroplane, radio, television, there is a violent moment of exuberant, completely... Um, idiotic optimism in which people predict that this is going to um, inaugurate a new era of human communication, world peace and harmony. With completely regular inevitability, this is followed by a violently painful hangover in which people discover that new forms of communication 
are equally open to bad uses yes. as they are to good. Yes. And then the legislators, rather slowly, catch up and usually do something that it lies somewhere between these two extremes. I agree with Torrin about accountability. It is not a violation of the principle of a free press to ask for some accountability. The question is what accountability you ask for. Roger said, what are we so frightened of? I would prefer, Roger, what I called earlier a mixed economy of regulation if I, if I could find it. And I don't think vulnerable people are fair game. A question, uh, first of all, for Mick, that um, you said that you thought that, that today's situation was very new. I think from the point of view of sort of journalism academics, of, of which I'm one, it maybe looks like a, a kind of rehash of an old set of prejudices, that there was always a sort of snobbish um, uh, view of, of tabloids, which was underpinned by a snobbish view of tabloid readers. Um, in the 80s, that was uh, seemingly a kind of political argument, uh, because uh, right-wing tabloids like The Sun were persuading Essex man to vote Tory. Now it takes a different form of disgust with kind of gossip and celebrity culture. But ultimately, isn't the, the press uh, accountable to the public? Um, this is for everybody, really. Um, isn't the press accountable to the public because they, they choose to buy it or not? I have some sympathy with what George said about the problems that editors have in understanding privacy law. But I can assure you, George, it's not just editors that have that problem. It's also the judges who write these very lengthy judgments. Um, and the evidence for that comes from that after Mr. Justice Nicholl has given a 128-paragraph judgment, which is intended to be a definitive statement of the law, you can fairly safely assume that there will be another judgment given by one of his brother judge judges, which will be even longer and which will be a further refinement of what was previously said. And so it goes on and on. Now, there is a reason for this, which is that you cannot, with legal principles, define what is in the public interest. And that is why when every different factual matrix comes along for the judges to concern themselves with, they have to refine and tweak and further complicate the judgments and the guidelines that they previously gave. Now, that is the problem that you have if you ask the lawyers to regulate on the notion of privacy. I think if you want to see the problems with privacy legislation and statutory regulation of the press, you need to look at France, where the press has singularly failed to break every major political scandal um, that's been in existence. And uh, Mitter on second term, uh, it was not revealed at that time that he not, not only was a bigamist, but he also um, was given a year to live by doctors, um, aspects which we would have thought would have been in the public interest. I, mean, I think for me the only question of, uh, of regulation of the press should be self-regulation by good journalism. Good journalism as the, uh, as, the, as the weapon for bad. And the sort of journalism you're talking about, of course, you know, it's, it's disgraceful, but uh, it's quite, you're quite within your right to, to write columns saying why it's the wrong sort of thing to do, and to, and to do a sort of journalism which is sufficiently compelling to win over, over, over viewers. So I think that the only, the only weapon should be good journalism against bad. It seems to me, though, that um, both um, the liberal um, press and also the tabloid press share one thing in common, and that is that they think the public, especially the working class, are worthy of nothing more than the most common denominator. Uh, Mick made the point that this, the contempt for the public is at the heart of this, and I, I know there's been questions from the audience too. But my question is, historically I've always wanted to say don't blame the messenger, but when it comes to contempt for the public, we know it's throughout the political sphere. I mean, a horrendous elitism now in every sphere. But to what extent do you think, for example, sections of the media have promoted that contempt themselves? I mean, we've already heard where the suggestions for Leveson came from. On the question of accountability, I answered a question earlier about how the public were consulted about this, and I, I've actually left out, thank you to the person for reminding me, the most important one of all, or one of the most important, which is looking at who actually buys what in what quantities. Um, on the question of the public interest, judges and law, uh, I don't actually want public interest defined only by judges. I would actually like it put in uh, the free expression and publication legislation as a parliamentary decision in the way that we normally make these decisions. I accept that it is an extremely elusive and elastic idea. It is very difficult to define with precision and it will be argued about. But I still think that some definition, particularly in the pieces of law that have none, would be better than nothing. On the subject of privacy, my complaint about the Human Rights Act, which governs privacy, is that it creates an extremely wide motorway across which these judges zigzag. I would like Parliament to consider giving them rather less room to manoeuvre between this collision of rights, because I think that will be a less bad solution. 
On the question which has arisen quite frequently about contempt for the public, quite a lot of Leveson was about contempt for members of the public like the McCanns and the Dowlers. Well, you just made exactly the point that I wanted to make, so thank you very much for that. Um, also, I, I have to say that I, I don't think you can assume that everyone in government is contemptible, uh, despises the public, just because they went to Eton. I mean, I mean if, if, Andrew oh, Mitchell, if Andrew Mitchell said, I mean, I'm, I'm no fan of this government, if Andrew Mitchell said plebs, and I think he probably did, that would certainly reveal a degree of contempt to people from a different class or background to him. But I don't think you can necessarily make that assumption, and I certainly don't think you can make the assumption as that newspapers despise their public. As I said earlier, we don't exist without them. We can't afford to despise them. And it's about knowing your market and, and you know, catering for that market. Um, I think we do need to establish better what the public interest is. Um, I think that we do need to protect the most vulnerable. I think that the Dowlers and the McCanns were not protected enough in their exposure to the media in recent years. And I think that the fact, Mick, that it's difficult to know how to frame this stuff does, is no argument for not doing it. Everything in life is difficult. And every single framework or set of regulations or whatever or law you come up with has winners or losers. And it's a case of engaging with the, the complexity of that, getting the best people to do it, and somehow edging your way towards something that's relatively workable and rational, rational and good. There is a new accountability that will come ever more accountable. It is the internet. And um, if you get a fact wrong or make an unreasonable opinion or just something that people disagree, disagree with, I mean, the tweets fly straight for your throat, mm. some of them very cutting indeed. So to say that newspapers uh, are not accountable, they will face more and more public accountability through modern communications. The vulnerable, I agree with, but don't forget that the McCanns actually courted and sought a huge amount of publicity and, and uh, to try and find their child, and it was largely turned against them by libels from the Portuguese police, possibly by accepting bribes from... Uh, you, uh, Roger, you'll, we can discuss this later. The, 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 real, the real problem is that individual cases do not make good law. That person was treated badly, and, and the whole edifice of law could be, could be built upon that. I stand and hold a line that statutory regulation of the press uh, is not a good idea, despite all the things that you think the press, all the misdemeanors you may think they may have been responsible for. That although the sky will not fall in if there's merely statutory underpinning, it is a line that should not be crossed. And because broadcasting is not free, that can never be an argument for enchaining the press in a modern world where there's an endless supply of information and views. Uh, some great questions. Thank you very much for all of those. I'm sorry I won't have a chance to answer them, particularly the last batch. Um, just on this one question, see, I think we can cut through a lot of the complexities and all of that by, by saying this is not a question for lawyers and judges. There are first principles that need to be established before uh, uh, we allow them to start monopolising this discussion. By the way, the, uh, the idea that TV regulation, I, I share raise terror at the idea that TV regulation should be extended to newspapers. What could be more dull or conformist than the BBC? You know, that, if that's the, what, what we really, what we, or, or, and, and Channel 4, it's kind of, kind of um, um, public symbols of what uh, a, 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 a free media ought to look like. Um, when's the last time you saw something genuinely dangerous on the BBC? I would, I would, uh, uh, Citizen Khan, that's very kind of... Uh, well, Panorama on Monday night might be fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> but my, my non-complex point is this. The abuse of freedoms, the fact that some abuse our most important freedoms is not an excuse for allowing the authorities or anybody else to infringe and impinge on those freedoms. You know, what happened to the McCanns, we can all say that's terrible. What we must not uh, accept is that they can be turned into kind of human shields for a crusade for those who are pursuing a very different agenda about purging the press of everything which is not to their tastes. And that's what's in danger of happening. Nick Clegg says the test for, the, for press regulation is can we look the, the Dowlers and the McCanns in the eye? I'm sorry, that is not the test for a free press in a free society in which the public can, can choose for itself. So what I want to say is let us by all means take the press to task for all of its problems and its perfidies. Let us also defend the indivisible right of a free press to be an unwieldy mess and resist all attempts to sanitise, disinfect, shrink wrap, or otherwise make it safe and respectable to the taste of some.